All right, hello everybody. Hi, my name is Amalia Weber. I am the program specialist here at Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program, an, even with Orville, an evening with Orville and Catherine Wright. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask the audience members please silence or turn off their cell phones before we begin in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. We'd like to thank the, the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library and their many fundraising efforts. It's thanks to their support that we can provide wonderful programming like tonight's presentation. Their next fundraising event is the Friends of the RHPL 7th Annual Wine, Wit, and Wisdom Fundraiser, which is taking place at the library on Saturday, April 30th from 6.30 to 10 p.m. Participants will attend two speaker presentations from a choice of six and enjoy a buffet dinner, drinks, a silent auction, and a 50-50 raffle. Registration forms are available at the circulation desk, or you can visit rhpl.org friends for more information. Our next program is Improving Water Quality Begins in Your Backyard, which will be an in-person event Tuesday, April 19th at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. We have some special guests with us today, this evening in 1925. We have Orville Wright, who with his brother Wilbur made the first ever powered flights by man. And with him is his sister Catherine, who is very instrumental in promoting their aircraft throughout the world. Now Orville is not quite here yet, so please welcome Catherine Wright. Thank you. It's so nice, excuse me, <laughs> you, um, thank you so much for being here uh, tonight. It's a privilege uh, uh, to see you, and I'm, uh, Orville and I were so excited uh, to have you invite us here. And now, uh, as you heard, Orville is running a little late. Um, he's riding an airplane in uh, a friend, hopping a a flight in with his friend, and due to the um, strong winds, he's running a bit late, but he should be able to arrive uh, momentarily, and we'll just uh, wait. Oh, there he is now. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I apologize for being late. A friend of mine flew me in in an open cockpit plane, and uh, the... Uh, a uh, lot of headwinds we ran into, it slowed us down, and the landing was a little bumpy too. It had been a while since they mowed the grass. Uh, but we were obviously arrived safely, and so again, I apologize for holding you up, and, and uh, Catherine, you can take over as usual. Yes, yes. I'm the talkative one. <laughs> um, we don't have any prepared speeches, um, but we understand you have questions for us. And we like to be organized, uh, so we've asked that those questions be numbered, and I'm told that that has been done. So we will take them in order. Now, when your uh, number is called, if you would stand up and give us your name so we could become a little more acquainted with each other, uh, tell us which one of us you want to ask the question to, and um, then ask the question, and we will try to answer it. So we'll start with the obvious. Uh, number one, who ha do you have number? Yes, oh, you have number one. And your name? Mary, and what question do you have? Oh. Uh, yes, uh, so you want to know about my childhood, Mary? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I'll start with uh, at the beginning. Mary, I was uh, born in the upstairs bedroom of our Dayton, Ohio home and um, on August 19th, 1874. And it just so happened to be Orville's third birthday. I was a very nice birthday present for you, wasn't I? Yes, Wilbur was seven and two older brothers, 12 and 13. Now, uh, because we were the youngest, Wilbur, Orville, and I, we have been always very close. Now, Wilbur, once or off, 
often would mention that um, to be successful in life, you needed first to pick a good mother and father, and then begin your life in Ohio. I tend to agree because I can't imagine another family could have a happier childhood than ours. Father Milton was a bishop in the church. Uh, he was strict and demanding, but he also encouraged us to learn and explore ideas. Our mother, Susan, well, she was quiet and shy. I obviously did not take those, uh, inherit those traits from her. Uh, but she was amazing. She could build anything and build it well. She uh, saw something very special in Orville and Wilbur, and she never discarded anything they built. Sadly, she passed away from tuberculosis. Me, being the only female in the household, became the family hostess. Even though I was only 14 years old, I began running the, running the household, cooking, cleaning, did the family correspondence, the accounts, and also worked uh, with my father in his business. So that's a little bit about uh, my childhood. I hope that answered your question, Mary. And who has number two? Yes, and your name? Betty. Betty. Oh. My name is B <coughs> Betty. Betty wants to know how I became interested in flight. Well, Betty, our father, uh, Milton, brought us a toy airplane from a trip to France. It had two uh, propellers and was propelled by uh, rubber bands. Now, <coughs> um, we started to kind of, as little kids, you know, play with it a lot, but we fantasized it. Do you think someday someone could build one large enough to fly people in it and be powered by something other than rubber bands? And, you know, we really never lost that uh, excitement and that dream. Well, um, I built a kite when I was 10 years old, and uh, it worked pretty well, so I built a few more and actually sold some. Uh, I got my mechanical ability from our mother, Susan, uh, and uh, that's where I, I got my shyness, too. You probably don't realize it, but it's harder than you think for me to speak in front of groups like this, but I'm getting better at it, and uh, actually we leave a lot of it up to Catherine. She's so good at it. Uh, so... Uh, my brother and I like to uh, cycle, and so we opened the right cycle exchange where we repaired bicycles, and then we started to build them and sell them, and we changed the name to Wright Cycle Company, and uh, we did, did pretty well at that. Well, I continued my interest in uh, aviation and, and flying uh, as a hobby, really, and I got some books from the Smithsonian Institute, and uh, one was from Octave Chanute, who is the leading world expert in gliders, and another written by Samuel Langley, who was uh, head of the Smithsonian Institute. So uh, we studied those uh, books, and uh, we started to kind of build larger gliders just to kind of test out our ideas about whether we could maybe someday build something large enough for men to fly in. And uh, the rest, they say, is history. So uh, that was number two. Uh, who has number three, and who is it for? Yes, and your name? Patsy? How do we come to build the first airplane, Patsy wants to know. <coughs> well, Patsy, our first machine really wasn't an airplane. It was a large biplane glider. And uh, we built it in Dayton. And then we took it off to uh, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The reason we did that, because there were prevailing winds from the Atlantic, and it would give us a lot of lift. Uh, besides, not a lot of trees there. There was sand hills. Uh, so if we crashed, uh, kind of unlikely we'd crash into a tree. And the sand was pretty good, too. If you did crash, it uh, didn't hurt so much. So uh, we took our glider there. And uh, <laughs> the local people you know, were curious, because we had this large biplane glider, and they said, well, what, what are you fellas doing? We said, well, we're experimenting, and eventually, you know, we maybe hope to 
get this thing where we could get some kind of an engine and, and maybe people could fly in it. Well, they were very skeptical. In fact, one skeptic wrote in a local paper, I can always remember the words, he said, <clears throat> we have a good God, a bad devil, and a hot hell. And that same God never intended that man should fly. Well, in spite of uh, all the uh, skepticism, why, uh, we kept pursuing our dream. And uh, so we went on and, and uh, did that. So we, uh, uh, so our, our successful uh, glider, we got so uh, Wilbur and I could soar uh, along the sand hills and so forth in our, in our glider. And uh, so that was really our first flying attempt. So thanks for that question. Uh, next one is number four. All right. All right. All right. Diane wants to know about my college years. Well, my father felt that I needed a career in order uh, to be independent and take, um, uh, take care of myself financially. Um, there were not many uh, women attending college in those days and very few careers that were open for uh, women. He uh, selected Oberlin College in uh, North uh, Ohio near Cleveland. It um, was a uh, school very uh, strict. Uh, they, uh, well, alcohol and tobacco were forbidden, and they required everyone to rise at 6 a.m. and lights out at 10 p.m. Now, I um, had been living with... Um, men, <laughs> growing up and living with all men. So it, it was a, a big change for me to suddenly be living in a house full of women. But I soon made uh, very good friends with some wonderful women, and we had fun oh, organizing parties and, and going on picnics and uh, camping, camping trips and bicycle rides. Now, I started my studies to be a teacher in classic um, languages. And um, I uh, excelled in all my classes. Well, all of them except math. But there was a gentleman that took his meals at our uh, boarding house. Uh, Harry Haskell was his name, and he uh, volunteered to tutor me in math three times a week. So we became very good friends. In fact, he even proposed to one of my best friends. Oh, I also received a proposal and was engaged to Arthur Cunningham. Now, but after two years, I broke it off. He seemed relieved. But I was sad uh, for a few, few days or so. But later, I looked back at my breakup as my narrow escape. Well, I uh, received my diploma at age 23. Uh, I'm the only member in our family to ever re earn a college degree. But it did take me five years. I took a year off to... Nurse Orville, when he came down with um, typhoid fever. Now, I had a very, after graduation, I had a very difficult time finding a job. It took me almost a year before I was hired as a substitute teacher. My first full time job was uh, teaching a required Latin. Uh, class to rather problem uh, children that uh, could be quite disruptive. But having grown up in a house full of boys, I knew exactly what to do to nip those teenage boys' in behavior in the bud, and that's what I did. So that was question number four, and who has number five? Yes. Bob? Bob? Me again? Okay. Oh, what did I think 
of their interest. Well, I thought it was intriguing. It started uh, as a hobby, but they soon became uh, uh, much more serious about that. Um, they um, also um, almost quit uh, that second summer in Kitty Hawk. Do you remember, Orville, the letter you wrote me about the invasion of the mosquitoes? Yes, well, I have happened to have a copy of that letter with me, and I'm going to read it to you. Okay, the sand and the grass and the trees and the hills and everything was full, fairly covered with them. They chewed us clear through our underwear and socks. Lumps began swelling up all over our body like hen's eggs. We attempted to escape by going to bed, which we did a little after five o'clock. We wrapped up in our blankets with, our, with only our noses protruding from the folds, thus exposing the least possible surface to attack. The summer heat kept mounting and our blankets became unbearable. The perspiration would roll off us in torrents. Misery, misery. We almost left for home, but finally the mosquitoes diminished. Later, the locals told us it happens about every 10 years. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised that they were discouraged, <clears throat> but uh, Wilbur said, not in a thousand years will men fly. But once they came home and started printing out the photographs they had of Wilbur soaring in the glider, their enthusiasm returned, right? Yes. Now, while they were in uh, Kitty Hawk, I was running the household, watching over their bicycle shop, paying uh, the bills, depositing receipts, and uh, fighting with the help. The machinist, Charlie Taylor and I were not very fond of each other. So that was, I believe, number five. Uh, who has number six? Yes, and you, Leah. Leah, is it? Leanne. Leanne, now when did we first, once know when we first flew under power? Well, Leanne, it was in 1903, and uh, uh, that same Charlie Taylor, uh, <coughs> although he didn't get along with our sister, was a good mechanic, bicycle mechanic, and he built us a 12 horsepower engine. And so we uh, built a biplane that could hold that, and we took it out to Kitty Hawk and uh, assembled it there. And we, we built a ramp that went down a sand dune, and we would put the uh, airplane at the top of the ramp, and when, when we let go, it would go down the ramp and pick up speed. So it would help, uh, in case there wasn't quite enough wind, help to get airborne. And if uh, Wilbur was flying, I would run alongside and hold the wing to steady it as it went down the ramp. Well, we were there in December of 1903, and we flipped a coin, and Wilbur won. And so he got to fly that day. Well, uh, he got uh, the engine going and everything, and... It got airborne about 100 feet. Leanne, is it? Leanne, about 100 feet, and then into the sand. And uh, so tried again, went a few feet more, tried a few more, and that was about it for that day. Well, then on December 17th, uh, which is a historic day, you'll find out, on December 17th, 1903, it was my turn. So we went back out there again, and I had the same luck, about 100 feet. Second run, about 100 feet, and I said, you know, people keep saying the third time is the, is the, the real gem, so maybe the third time will be, will be the jewel. wasn't. Uh, but on the fourth try, Leanne, I got airborne, and I flew for a whole minute, and I flew over 900 feet. Now, that is over the length of three football fields, and so that we considered a successful flight. Well... Uh, unfortunately, our plane that we called the Flyer was destroyed by high winds later that day and uh, couldn't be um, repaired. So we shipped it back to Dayton, stored it for a while, and <clears throat> now it is in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. The reason is, again, that was the first time in the history of man ever that man has flown under power. 
first time ever. And I'm so glad that Wilbur and I were able to be a part of that, Leanne. So uh, what's the next question number? Number seven, who is that for? Me. And who is that? Who is your question for? Uh, for, you. for me. Dawn, you said? Dawn wants to know if there were uh, other people experimenting with flight at the same time. Yes, Dawn, there were. Well, I answered your question, right? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I have a sense of humor that gets me in trouble every once in a while, Dawn. Yes, um, one of them, of course, was uh, Samuel Langley, the head of the Smithsonian Institute. Now, he had this great big machine built and uh, it was launched from a barge in the Potomac River. Went a few feet and plunged into the icy Potomac. Well, they got it out, and fiddled around with it, and a couple weeks later, launched again and went about three feet further into the icy Potomac, and they gave up. Now, the Smithsonian had spent $70,000 on this failure. So Wilbur and I said, I wonder what we spent on our success. And uh, we got out a piece of paper. Dawn, it was a thousand bucks. And that included four years of train trips back and forth from Dayton to uh, Kitty Hawk. And Dawn, not a penny of it was government money. It all came from money that we earned in our bicycle shop. So anyway, that's how, uh, uh, and there were many others who failed too. So, uh, n next one is number eight. Yes, sir. All right. It's Al. <laughs> well, we'll ask, uh, we'll answer your uh, first part of the question first. Um, there it was. How was uh, their success received? Uh, let's see, there was um, much more interest in their invention in France than there was in the United States. Oh, the French were very enthusiastic. Uh, but some wondered if perhaps my brothers were bluffing because there had been no uh, press releases or announcements from the United States on their flying successes. But they weren't flying uh, to win prizes in contests in uh, France. They were testing their aircraft in fields where people such as uh, farmers and uh, uh, passengers on the trolley car and even cows were all in um, amazement watching Wilbur uh, fly in controlled maneuvers. Uh, later, more people were in awe. Uh, when he uh, flew in the trials at Le Mans uh, racetrack, uh, flying in uh, circles uh, around the racetrack and uh, flying in figure eights. <coughs> um, let's see, uh, I think it was uh, about six months, in six months, uh, over 200,000 people had watched, in France, had watched Wilbur fly. They knew my Wright brothers were not uh, bluffing. Now, while uh, they were having uh, some time in, or having busy in uh, Europe, I was home dealing with their increased fame. Not only was I still teaching and uh, running the households and watching over the bike shop, I was now dealing with magazines and newspapers and as asking uh, uh, all sorts of questions. Uh, some of them were uh, very scientific and others were rather crink calls. But uh, there was a positive with all these activities. Uh, I came across uh, some of my former uh, friends from Oberlin College and we have renewed correspondence, which was, uh, is fun. Uh, I think that uh, answers, uh, you're not gonna complain? about me corresponding with Oberlin friends? Yes, I know it. You always say that. <laughs> what? You mean Harry Haskell? Are you talking about the only Harry Haskell? 
he's married. So we are not corresponding. All right, that's enough of that. Uh, that question was number eight. Who has number nine? Again, your name is Bud. Bud wants to know if we moved our uh, flight testing to Dayton. Uh, yes, Bud, we did. We got tired of those train trips uh, to Kitty Hawk. The only trouble with uh, Dayton, we had a nice field, uh, Huffman Prairie, but there wasn't always enough wind. So uh, we built a new plane, of course. The other one was a flyer was crashed, so we named it the Flyer 2. And uh, we developed a catapult. We had a tower about 20 feet tall. And with a tractor, we could pull a large weight up to the top of the trailer, or the, the, the uh, tower, and then with pulleys, hook a rope to the front of the airplane. And then when we released that weight, it would pull the airplane down that uh, ramp that we had built and get it into the air without needing quite as much wind. Uh, and that worked pretty well. Uh, we were able to fly uh, 25 feet in the air, and Wilbur flew in a complete circle. Uh, and uh, so that was, uh, that was quite a thing. Uh, well, then we built um, the Flyer 3, and uh, uh, our mechanic built another, uh, Charlie built a 25 horsepower engine for that one. And that one, uh, we could really fly in. We could get uh, 100 feet in the air with that one. Uh, and uh, it, we flew for uh, 25 miles in that one day. So, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot today, but uh, it was a pretty big deal to us. Now, Wilbur uh, wrote down some of his experiences in some of the earlier flights, and uh, I think it just is a wonderful way of helping people understand uh, how, how exciting it was and how new. And I always uh, bring along a copy of that to uh, read to folks and to kind of honor my, my late brother Wilbur. Um, <coughs> He said, when you know, after the first few minutes, that the whole mechanism is working perfectly, the sensation is so keenly delightful as to be almost beyond description. Nobody who has not experienced it for himself can realize it. There is a realization of a dream of so many persons have had of floating in the air. More than anything else, the sensation is one of perfect peace mingled with excitement that strains every nerve to the utmost if you can conceive of such a combination. So that kind of gives you a feeling of the excitement that Wilbur and I had. Uh, what's the uh, next question? Number 10. Andrea, all right. OK, Andrea wants to know when the US finally got interested in our work. Uh, well, they, they did ask us to uh, design a prototype for an Army project. Requirement was that it have had seats for two uh, seated. Before, we had always been laying down as we flew, but uh, it had to be two people seated. So uh, I guess the second person for the Army would be an observer or maybe threw some bombs over. I don't know, but they wanted... They wanted uh, two seats, and we were able to do that with the Flyer 3 with its 25 horsepower engine. So uh, one day, uh, I, we did some trial flights, and it was working, and so I had to do a demonstration flight at Fort Myer outside of uh, Washington. And so one day, I flew for over 1,000 people watching, senators and dignitaries and so forth, watched as we qualified for this. And for that one prototype, they paid us $25,000. Uh, so that was how we finally got uh, the US interested in our work. And, and it was a good feeling to finally be recognized uh, you know, by, our own, by our own country. Uh, what is the next question? 11, who has 11? Oh, it's for you, Catherine. Yes. What are my reactions to Orville's uh, crass injuries? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, well, when I received a telegram stating that Orville was in critical condition uh, but expected to live, I immediately put in a... What? 
<laughs> oh, well, that might be important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah well, that's, well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, uh, uh, when, when after we flew that trial, uh, I was thinking it happened later, but after we flew that successful trial and everything, uh, we were still flying with the uh, two people in, in the plane. And one day I was flying with a young fellow, Lieutenant uh, Thomas Selfridge, and uh, unfortunately a propeller tip came, broke off, and we crashed. And I uh, was in critical condition with a broken leg, a broken hip, and four broken ribs, but I did survive, and unfortunately Lieutenant Selfridge did not. He died of his injuries. Now that was the first recorded passenger death in aircraft history. First ever of a passenger. And to commemorate his contributions to aircraft development, Selfridge Air Base here in this area is named after Lieutenant Selfridge. So uh, anyway, I, yes, yes, I, I, uh, I was thinking that that happened later. All right, you finally let me talk for a while. Okay, um, back to your question. Uh, was it Mike? Okay, it was how my action was. Now that we know that he had a crash and, and was injured and all that sort of stuff, he was in critical uh, condition. Uh, but as he said, he's still alive. Um, but um, let's see, I've got... Did you put that there? Okay. Uh, anyway, let's go back to the uh, start. Um, when I first saw how, um, well, when I received the, I guess I should go back. Uh, when I received the notice, I put in an indefinite um, uh, pause to my uh, uh, teaching. I put in a, uh, that I wasn't going to teach for a while and determined. Um, leave of absence. Uh, I went that very same night after I received the telegram, uh, boarded a plane, a train to head to the base hospital in Washington, D.C. But when I first saw how terrible he looked, it took all the strength I had to smile and act as if nothing happened and nothing was wrong. I even uh, tried to make him laugh, but he said it hurt. Later, he did say that uh, first he thought, well, it can't be all that bad, or I would have reacted differently. But no, his uh, injuries were very serious, and he was in the hospital for five weeks before we brought him home. So uh, a little delayed, but yes, we talked about uh, <laughs> what I did after he crashed. Uh, and the next question is, that was 11. 12 is the next question. Oh, me again. Oh, what did Wilbur do? Well, he did have some successful um, accomplishments. Uh, he um, uh, won the Michelin Cup race, taking off without the aid of a catapult. Uh, he also, um, let's see, what else did uh, you, Wilbur do? Uh, oh, he won the Aero um, Club de France gold medal. That came with a prize and also a banquet with Gustav Eiffel, the um, designer of the Eiffel uh, Tower. Now I complained to Wilbur that he should come home, but instead he suggested that uh, Father Orville and I travel to uh, Europe. Well, I, he also suggested that I become their social and business manager. I wasn't sure he really meant it until a couple of months later he repeated that offer uh, with a salary added. So I was tempted. Now Father turned down the invitation to travel to Europe, but since I had never been outside of the United States, I couldn't say no. So Orville and I boarded an ocean liner and uh, went to meet Wilbur in Po, France. Now, um, let's see, what else uh, can I say about this? Um, my brothers were 
very or very shy. They did not like being in the limelight, uh, but they needed help in um, selling their airplane to the French. So they put me in charge of meeting the press because I'm so much more outgoing. And uh, <laughs> um, I uh, soon became, I soon dominated the social scene. I met many lovely and interesting people, uh, including counts and dukes and even a king. Now, I practiced very diligently to do the proper curtsy before meeting King Alfonso XIII. But when I finally met him, I forgot everything that I just smiled and shook his hand. Well, later, <laughs> I was told he was not offended, and he thought I was quite charming. Oh, it was fun and exciting to uh, be in uh, Europe. I just loved every minute of it. So thanks for asking that question. I believe that was 12, 13. Who has the lucky 13? Dale? Oh, OK. I'm sorry, Dale, what? You cry. OK, Dale wants to know if I flew again after the crash. Uh, not right away, Dale, um, but uh, I did go over to France to join uh, Catherine and Wilbur, uh, and um, it was interesting, uh, uh, Dale, when I got over there, I, I found that the French women were quite taken with Wilbur. He was a handsome uh, individual, and the reason I learned that is there was something, an uh, interview published in, in a local paper, and so I got the English translation of it. And uh, I always uh, teased Wilbur about it, and uh, people seem to enjoy uh, hearing this article. So I'll, uh, I'll share it with you. <coughs> now again, this was an interview with, uh, by a newspaper person of a married woman and her first meeting with Wilbur. She said her first impression was not altogether favorable, but stated, Mr. Wright appeared a bit too rough and rugged. His expression was fixed and terribly stern. His expression, the moment he opened his lips to speak, the severity of the veil of severity vanished. His voice is warm, sympathetic, and vibrating. There is a kindly look that imparts exceptional charm and refinement to his bright, intelligent eyes. The frank way in which he looks straight in the eyes of the person to whom he speaks and the firm grip of his wiry muscular hand seem to give true insight to his character and temperament. He impressed me as one of the most remarkable men I have ever met. The reporter concludes the article with a statement. You can understand why this married woman did not want to be quoted in the press. Well, <laughs> he told me that he was really more interested in if they had articles about our airplane rather than about uh, his <coughs> uh, impression uh, and, and reaction on, on women. Well, <coughs> when we returned from uh, France, we had quite a reception in New York Harbor. All the boats blew their whistles when we got off the ship. Uh, reporters and photographers were there. We went to Dayton. We had a two-day two celebration with a parade. And then a couple of weeks later, we went to Washington, D.C. and received a medal from President Taft from the Aero Club of America. It was finally nice to be recognized in our own country after all these years. Well, I did get back to flying, Dale. And so I wanted to go back to Fort Myer where I'd crashed and do some more f uh, flights. Well, we got a chance to compete for another contract. And this one was to build... Um, several airplanes, and they would pay us $30,000 for these if, if it worked out. And my demonstration flight there, I had to fly a round trip uh, of 10 miles at 40 miles an hour, and went about, again, about 100 feet off the ground, and, and we did that. So then we got this contract to build uh, several planes for the Army. And again, it was so nice that our government, Dale, was finally recognizing our, our accomplishments. So. Uh, that was number 13.
Yes, who has 14? All right. Oh, you want to know whether uh, my brothers uh, flew together? Yes, they did for one time, a six-minute flight, after they received permission from uh, Father to do so, because he had made them promise not to fly, ever fly together due to uh, safety concerns. Uh, I took my first flight in, uh, while in France. Oh, before that, I do want to add that uh, Father went up with uh, Orville for a seven-minute flight, his uh, first and only flight, and he seemed to enjoy it. Uh, he kept uh, calling to Orv, higher, Orv, higher, and you, uh, reached, they reached um, a flying altitude of 350 feet. Okay, well, go back to me. I uh, took my first flight uh, in France. Um, I wasn't the first, uh, I was the third female to fly. The first one was Edith Berg. She was a wife of one of our sales agents. And before she went uh, flying, she tied her skirts down around her ankles with rope for modesty uh, sake. And uh, her picture was taken and uh, appeared on magazines, a fashion magazine, and it is rumored that started the fashion trend of hobble skirts. Now, in case you're interested, yes, I guess for the men we have to describe that. That's a round, you know, a balloon type of thing tied at the bottom, so it looks like, yeah. Okay, for those men that don't know the hobble skirt. Um, Let's see, where was I? Um, I flew, as I said. Uh, I also tied my skirts around uh, my uh, ankles because I did not want my ankles to show, and heaven forbid, my legs. Well, I uh, continued to uh, be their social uh, manager, and I never went back to teaching after that. So thanks for that question, and that was uh, 14. Who has number 15? Yes. Terry? Yes, Terry. Terry wants to know about uh, us teaching others to fly. Um, well, Terry, we, we had a flying school down in Alabama. It later became uh, Army Air uh, Corps Base. Uh, we had one in Georgia, and we had one in Huffman Prairie in, uh, outside of Dayton. And... Uh, Terry, we taught, uh, in about six years, taught 120 people to fly our right aircraft. And, of course, these were most of the pioneers that went on to develop the whole aircraft industry. Uh, one interesting fella was uh, from this area, a little town of Northville out toward Ann Arbor. And his name was Eddie Stinson. And uh, we taught him to fly. And then he started his own aircraft company in Northville, Michigan. Uh, and then uh, uh, went on to uh, it went on to be merged with uh, several other companies. But anyway, so uh, it just shows you how uh, many of these people went on. Now, it was very primitive um, in those days. You see, most of the people we were training, again, they were army people, uh, were never flown, much less piloted a plane. So we had to be very, very basic and primitive. So. Uh, I brought with me, just to give you an example, uh, this is a poster that they put up in the air bases, the 1919 U.S. Army Field Service Flying Regulations. And I'm just going to read you a, a few of these. But again, they are quite primitive, but they are the official flying regulations. Don't turn sharply when taxiing. Instead of turning short, have someone lift the tail around. Pilots should carry hankies in a handy position to wipe off their goggles. So my white scarf that I wore this morning in here this, this evening was not a fashion statement. It was to wipe my goggles off. Do not trust altitude instruments. That was number 10. Number 11, learn to gauge altitude, especially on landing. Number 18, if flying against the wind and you wish to turn and fly with the wind, don't make a sharp turn near the ground. You might crash. 
Don't attempt to force machines into the ground with more than flying speed. The result is bouncing and ricocheting. Aviators will not wear spurs while flying. Now, some people wonder, well, remember, these were army folks. They would ride their horse through the field out to the plane. And if they forgot to take off their spurs, it would get caught in the, in the mechanisms or tear the fabric and cause all kinds of problems. So they had to be reminded to take off their spurs. If an emergency occurs while flying, land as soon as possible. <laughs> that makes sense. Number 26, it is advisable to carry a good pair of pliers in a position where both the pilot and the passenger can reach them in case of an accident. A pair of pliers. And the final one, uh, joy rides will not be given to civilians. So that's how primitive things were in those days. Some people don't realize it. So that was number 15. And who has number 16? All right. Yes. Karen? Okay. Karen wants to know what happened to our company. Well, Karen, uh, unfortunately, um, Wilbur died in, uh, in 1912 of typhoid fever. I had survived it when I was younger, uh, being nursed by, by my sister, but fortunately he passed away. Uh, we were devastated. We were devastated. In fact, uh, we were just talking yesterday that Saturday would have been his, uh, his 58th birthday. Uh, he died when he was only 44. But this Saturday, the 16th, would, be his, would have been his 58th birthday. Anyway, so uh, we did keep the company, Karen, a couple of years and then sold it. Um, then uh, a couple of years after that, uh, it was bought by a fellow named um, uh, Wright, uh, not Wright, um, Martin. There are two Curtises. <laughs> there's, there's a Curtis Martin and another Curtis. Uh, but this was Curtis Martin, and he changed the name to Wright Martin Aircraft Company. And then he left that company, and the name was changed back to the Wright Aeronautical Company, and that's what it is today in 1925. So it is still going. Now, this fellow, um, Martin, was interesting. He went on and formed his own company, the Glenn Martin Company. Uh, he taught a fellow to fly that you might recognize. His name was Bill Boeing. Now, the interesting thing about Bill Boeing is that most of the people that were flying and making money in those days were carrying mail. That's the only way you could make money. Well, Bill Boeing uh, took a part of the mail compartment, Karen, and he put room in there for two passengers. Inside, you could get in through a side door. Of course, the pilot's still out in the open cockpit, but the two passengers could get in through a door, and so he is the one that really started passenger commercial aircraft. So if any of you ever uh, are brave enough to fly in this uh, evolving uh, business and take a flight in a plane, why, you can thank Bill Boeing for starting out to uh, decide how to carry passengers. Um, I think that's uh, one more, 17. Who has 17? Yes, sir. Who is, it, who is it yours for? Your name is Tom, and who is your question for? Kathleen. Kathleen. Catherine, uh, Tom, yes. Oh, we want to know what we're doing now. Uh, well, I was very involved with women's suffrage movement in Dayton, Ohio. I even persuaded Orville to walk in some of our marches. I'm still involved with women's rights, although we still we have the vote now. There are still some issues that need to be addressed. Uh, I'm also the officer, I became officer in the Wright Company um, after Wilbur had pers passed away. Uh, and I um, am on the board of trustees in Oberlin College as well. Uh, as for Orville, um, do you do anything? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no. Um, uh, what have you done? 
Oh, okay, yes. He actually uh, is sort of an elderly spokesman for the aviation field, and he uh, does serve on many uh, boards and uh, committees uh, dealing national um, uh, aviation. Uh, concerns. So I do believe that is the last of our questions. Um, I appreciate you asking those and inviting us here. Uh, Orville, would you want to add something? I know you don't like to talk. Well, I just uh, want to thank you all for coming, and we hope you've learned something about our inventions and something about our family, and uh, we do appreciate being invited here tonight. Now, I'm going to step out of character for a minute. Uh, I'm not Orville Wright. Uh, you know that. But I hope for a while you felt I was. And uh, Nancy was Catherine. Because at Doré Productions, we try to bring these historic characters to life. We've been here as um, uh, uh, Rose and Joe Kennedy a few years ago. Someone's nodding. <laughs> and uh, then we were on Zoom uh, as, uh, I believe, um, Mark Twain on Zoom for you. Yeah, and we're glad to be back in person, and we'll have a new, a new one next year if, if you'd like. Anyway, um, I'm really Russ Doré. I live in Northville, and uh, I got involved in murder mysteries a number of years ago at Gennetti's Restaurant in Northville, and uh, then we went on the dinner train out of Wall Lake and did murder mysteries, and then we got invited to do a historical uh, production at the Botsford Inn and wrote that for them involving Henry Ford, Harvey Firestone, Thomas Edison. Kind of started to get interested in history, and so we started to write and do historical ones. Um, also, a few years ago, you may remember, there were a lot of movies made in Michigan when there were incentives. And someone convinced them that it wasn't profitable, which uh, really uh, it depends how you do the math, but it gave a lot of nice recognition to Michigan and employed a lot of people, including Nancy and I as background actors which is a fancy word for extra. But uh, we had a lot of fun. I was in uh, a movie with George Clooney about aviation called Up in the Air, filmed at the Detroit airport. And uh, uh, if you know where to look on the back of the DVD cover, uh, I'm on there. I have a very unique hat. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. I also, this year, my COVID project has uh, became an author. So uh, my first book about a year ago was a Motor City drama. Uh, uh, historical fiction about the beginning of the auto industry with conversations between Henry Ford and Billy Durant and Walter Chrysler. I took history and uh, there were a lot of meetings they talked about, but I tried to take people inside the meetings and made up conversations. Had a lot of fun, consistent with history. And uh, next week, my second book is coming out on aviation. And it's called They Put America in the Air. And it's uh, with... Um, the Wright brothers, Bill Boeing and Donald Douglas. Uh, they're they're uh, available on Amazon. <laughs> uh, Ten bucks for one, eight for the other. And uh, uh, I also have some cards here if you wanted to, uh, uh, some information about how to find them and so forth. Um, so at this point, uh, I want to, uh, oh, I, I want to mention before I forget too that if any of you want photos with your cell phones afterwards, I'll put the goggles back on and we, you can get some pictures if you want. But at this time, I <coughs> want to bring you up to date on what happened to Orville and Catherine after 1925. Well, the Wright name is still in aviation, the Curtis Wright Company, following a merger with a company founded by Glenn Curtis. That's the other Glenn. Curtis was a bicycle mechanic in New York who became a champion motorcycle racer. He invented the aileron, which gave better control than the wing warping that the Wright brothers used. And all aircraft manufacturers then, including the Wright brothers, eventually adopted ailerons in their designs. Now his Curtis Airplane and Motor Company eventually merged with the Wright Company in 1929 to form the Curtis Wright Company. It was the largest military aircraft company during World War II, made 14,000 P-40 fighters, the one used by the famous Flying Tigers Squadron. The company currently is a $2 billion diversified corporation. Well, Orville made his last flight as a pilot in 1918. He was a board member of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, predecessor to NASA, for 28 years. 1930, he received the first Guggenheim Medal 
and in 1936 was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences. In 1938, their bicycle shop was moved to where? Greenfield Village. Greenfield Village, and that is the original one. Now, there's also an original one in Dayton uh, because there were two or three original ones because they moved and got uh, bigger shops. But this is uh, the one you've been in at Greenfield Village is an original. Well, Orville took his last airplane ride in 1944 in a Lockheed Constellation piloted by Howard Hughes. He commented that the wingspan of the constellation was longer than his first flight. Orville died in 1948 at age 76 of a heart attack. His total wealth was over a million dollars, or in today's dollars, over $10 million. He had lived to see aviation develop from his 12 horsepower engine to military jet planes. So now I want to introduce Nancy and let her tell about Catherine after 1925 and tell us about Nancy. Yes, in real life, my name is Nancy Schuster. If anyone uh, has seen this before, you know that uh, Russ and I are married, but not to each other. But we have been acting partners for over 30 years, having met playing Mr. and Mrs. Kirby in a community theater production of You Can't Take It With You, and the rest, of course, is history. I uh, was one of the original actors in his production company when he formed him, so I um, have been, I did the murder mysteries, uh, both at uh, restaurants and also the uh, train. But my uh, acting career, um, oh, I joined these historical presentations after he finally added a woman to a role to it. But my acting career actually uh, began in Hollywood when I was 12. I was born and raised in uh, the LA area. And I appeared in uh, three movies. I made um, half a dozen uh, commercials and was a guest actor in uh, several uh, series. Uh, then I went off to college and traveled the world and ended up in Michigan and got married and had kids. And <laughs> then uh, I signed up with some agents in the Detroit area, and I have done multiple commercials, uh, some industrial films, had a um, print ad for the ARP um, newspaper, uh, among other things. Uh, so be, that's enough of me. What are you laughing? Those are our real husband and wife. <laughs> I uh, came to see the, you know, um, new production that we're doing. But I'd like to uh, read about uh, Catherine now. Uh, she was only the second female to be elected to the Board of Trustees of the Oberlin College and worked for equal pay for women faculty members and was a member of Oberlin's teaching organization who met monthly to read plays. She was the first woman to attend a monthly banquet of the Aero Club de France uh, and one of the few women awarded the French Legion of Honor among, along with her brothers. She renewed her correspondence with Harry Haskell, her friend and tutor from Oberlin. After his wife died, they wrote frequently and met several times without Orville's knowledge. Yeah, he didn't care for him. After uh, devoting most of her life to her brother's passion of conquering, conquering flight, she had finally found love and life for herself. In 1926, they married and moved to Kansas City, where he became one of the principal owners of the Con Kansas City Star newspaper. Harry's adult son was very pleased with the marriage, but Orvo was not. He did not attend the wedding, nor did he ever speak to her again because of the marriage. Harry and uh, Catherine were planning a trip to Europe in 1929, but she caught a cold that turned into pneumonia. She died in March of 1929 at age 54. She was married to Harry for just two years and three months. Orville finally came to see her the day before she died. He donated $300,000 to Oberlin, that's equivalent to about a million today, and the college used it to build a Wright Laboratory of Physics. Harry presented Oberlin College with a marble foundation in front of the art building, an exact copy of the fountain in Florence, Italy. Harry felt they might have seen it had they made their trip to Italy. 
It bears the inscription to Catherine Wright Haskell, 1874 to 1929. Now, some people felt her brothers would not have been so successful without her charm. So you can decide, was she a benefit or not? It's your choice. <laughs> so thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed our presentation and learned uh, a little bit about it. So uh, again, thanks.